Hello, everyone. I'm Lucero Aguirre. My pronouns are she, they. One of two I'm one of two community programs coordinators within the community engagement team at Crystal Bridges. Um, welcome to this month's community circle discussion in real time, the state of Arkansas and transgender futures. Hi, I'm Sarah Sigerlin. My pronouns are she, hers, and I'm the director of community engagement. Uh, and it's been an honor to be a part of uh, this collaboration and this discussion today. Today, we will start with our program with a reading of Crystal Bridges land acknowledgement. As Crystal Bridges and the momentary, we recognize our role as settlers and guests in the Northwest Arkansas region. We acknowledge the Caddo, Quapa, and Osage, as well as many, the many indigenous caretakers of this land and water. We appreciate the enduring influence of the vibrant, diverse, and contemporary cultures of indigenous people. We are conscious of the role in colonization that museums have played. As cultural institutions, we have a responsibility to engage in the dismantling of historical and systemic invisibility of indigenous peoples, past, present, and future. We choose to intentionally hold ourselves accountable to appropriate conversation, representation, connection, and education to facilitate a space of measurable change. Uh, this acknowledgement also talks upon the museum's own reflection of, of where we are uh, within this system and our position uh, and this is something that we are evaluating on an ongoing basis. And we greatly are appreciative of our local community for informing uh, this accountability. To tease up today's discussion, I'd like to go over shared community agreements. And when we have this conversation uh, with each other, we really wanna uh, just honor each other uh, respect each person's narrative, uh, be inclusive and safe and sensitive to each person's opinion and viewpoints, uh, as well as being brave in the conversation. So again, I just kind of wanted to share that community agreement with everyone and, and those who may be joining us tonight. The chat feature is open for guests to share their thoughts while the discussion is occurring and we will call upon the chat feature for a couple questions from the audience at the end of the speaker's discussion. Each speaker will now briefly introduce themselves as we go along in the discussion. I'll briefly share the names of our speakers joining our group discussion. Speakers, please wave your hands as we call your names. Hannah McBroom. Rumai Yambu. Willow Brashears. And now we would like to welcome our collaborator with this program, Evelyn Rio Stafford, Washington County Justice of Peace and, and WA Equality team member, who is our moderator today, and will guide the discussion through a series of prompts to our guest speakers who have joined us in this virtual room. Evelyn. Yes, thank you, uh, Lucero and Sarah, uh, for the introduction. Um, I want to begin, uh, you know, by saying that uh, I hope we're going to have a good discussion uh, tonight that's going to be, uh, you know, educational and informative uh, about um, uh, basically this, this, the state of uh, trans people in the trans community in Arkansas, and specifically, uh, you know, in this context um, of, of art and culture, uh, and how that can help, um, uh, you know, uh, increase rights, awareness, um, and inclusion, ultimately. Um, as Lucera mentioned, um, I'm the uh, Justice of the Peace. I'm the first uh, openly trans uh, elected official in the history of Arkansas. And um, I'm proud to have done uh, several years uh, of work uh, with Northwest Arkansas Equality, um, which is the largest LGBTQ rights group uh, in Northwest Arkansas. Um, so as the moderator, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, uh, kickstart things uh, by uh, bringing in uh, artist Hannah McBroom. Uh, 
and uh, uh, get her, um, her view from her artist lens uh, about some artists that she feels are highlighting uh, the trans community through art right now. Um, Hannah? Hi, my name is Hannah McBroom. I'm an artist uh, based in St. Louis, and I got my start in Arkansas at the University of Arkansas with my master's. Um, I am also a trans woman. Um, and so with that, and with also with my, my research just into trans literature and trans philosophy, you know, what does it mean to actually have representation and what does it look like to have a, a a, a gamut of trans representation when it comes to issues and memory and identity. And so I'm gonna be talking about two artists, um, Castles, the artists, they have no gender, which I just used. So they don't use he, she, or they, and I struggle with talking about them because of that. Um, and also Juliana Huxtable, um, Lucera, um, so the first artist, Castles, is an artist um, that has got their start mostly with uh, performance art. Here we have um, a piece from 2017. Um, I apologize for my birds barking in the background, they're fighting. But um, this is a, a piece from 2017, a sculpture kind of born from performance, which the artist entitles Pissed. This is a 200 gallon vat of urine. Um, which the artist created 200 days, during the 200 days after um, Trump's uh, destabilizing of Obama era trans and LGBT protections. This was meant to kind of um, share the, the unbearable weight of trans persons and the uncomfortability of having to hold in their um, the, the ways that they produced. And um, with that, the policy based on their gender, allowing or not allowing them to use the restroom. For myself, being an artist and student in 2016 and 2017, um, the North Carolina bills that did not allow trans women to use the restrooms made me fearful of what it meant to go into the restroom either identifying as a woman or presenting as a woman or even um, looking like a woman. And so here the artist is showing like how much it, it feels like to, to hold this massive amount of weight. I can't, I think this piece weighs about 80 pounds. Um, and so viewers are allowed to see like the, the actual effects of not only this legislation, but the uh, effects on the body. Um, the, the next artist, uh, Juliana Huxtable, she has gone through a, a huge gamut when it comes to her ability to show what it means to be not only a, a trans woman, but also a, a, a minority, a black intersex, um, multicultural, multi uh, interdisciplinary artist. They are a writer, um, a DJ. Um, they spend a lot of their times in nightclubs um, performing. And so they come to the art spectrum or the art field with a very queer, very nuanced look at what it means to be a, a Black trans intersex woman. Um, here we have a recent piece from 2019 um, titled Neerum. And so the artist is, is talking about what it means to feel like a, um, an, an object. Um, their work has, has had to show what it means to be objectified, not only from a um, a standpoint as an object of art, but as a fetishized or objectified, or um, sorry, the right word is eroticized um, body. And so we have the heifer, which is the idea of, that kind of crosses into race and capitalism. Um, and if we go back to an earlier work um, from 2000 and I think eight, um, the third image, um, we have Untitled in the Rage, and uh, on the third tab, um, Untitled in the, in the Rage, um, which is a piece about um, being Black and being visible, but at the same time being um, objectified as a object of fantasy, of a, a erotic idea of Black skin. Um, and this piece alludes a lot to uh, Nubian and uh, Egyptian uh, imagery that was popular 
uh, several years ago in the black community. Um, and so we have green skin, yellow hair, and just um, a lot more subtle from the more recent uh, image that we saw previously to this, where it is a lot more explicit and a lot more in your face. Um, Juliana, I think is a wonderful person to look at when it comes to um, changing the way that um, trans bodies can be talked about because she's coming at it from a way that is, it, is, it, is playing with what language can be. Um, and so I can talk about that more, but I'm gonna leave it to the next uh, prompt with giving it back to Evelyn. Thank you, Hannah. Um, yeah. Thanks for uh, you know kind of warming us up into this discussion and for the excellent um, um, kind of analysis of, of some artists that are um, you know, doing some really interesting artwork right now um, in the trans community. Um, so from here, I wanted to kind of uh, jump into a, a series of questions, uh, open it up for the group uh, on the, you know, the recent legislation here in Arkansas uh, and representation. Um, as we go into our, our, first, uh, our first question for the group, I kind of wanted to start by providing some context, uh, you know, about the, uh, about what happened this year in the Arkansas legislature, just to break it down for folks um, about uh, the bills that were passed and, and what they do. Um, so Arkansas, the Arkansas legislature this year uh, passed an unprecedented number uh, of anti-trans bills. Um, there were four that passed in all, um, but there were many others that were proposed this year um, that, that didn't actually make it uh, into law. The four that, the four that were passed uh, by the legislature, uh, you know, uh, the one to focus on first is uh, HB 1570, uh, which is now known as Act 626. Uh, it, this measure makes Arkansas the only state in the U.S. Uh, to ban all gender-affirming medical care for trans youth 18 and under, regardless of parental consent. It also prohibits doctors from referring patients to other providers for such treatments and threatens doctors with professional sanctions. Uh, it does not include any grandfather clause for minors who are already undergoing treatment. Uh, the second bill that was passed was HB 286, uh, which allows medical providers to discriminate against LGBTQ people based on any religious, moral, or philosophical belief. SB 354 uh, bans trans youth as young as kindergarten uh, from playing on girls' sports and ignores existing NCAA policies uh, on trans inclusion at the college level. And finally is SB 450, uh, which is a companion bill uh, to the one I just mentioned, uh, which allows the attorney general to sue schools that violate the trans sports ban, including private schools that play against public schools. Uh, and I'm gonna start with uh, Roomba and Willow uh, with this first question. Uh, you both were there in many of these legislative committee hearings in Little Rock at the Capitol uh, when these bills were being debated. Um, can y'all talk about your experience and what you saw? Yeah, Willow, did you wanna go first? Oh no, you can go first. Okay. Um, it was awful. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it was really awful um, because they were so, they meaning the legislators were so blatantly transphobic, you know, they weren't even hiding it, right? So it was um, them like sp spitting out transphobia and everything that they would say, knowing that like their room was full of trans folks or like uh, cisgender people who have, um, you know, transgender loved ones, um, parents, grandparents that were there, and um, and the and the bias too because uh, the opposition or or the the folks supporting the bills uh, were allowed to speak for as long as they wanted, and um, and whenever it came to community members who were speaking against the bills, time was limited, and one of the I'm sure Willow will mention it, but one of the, the first committee meetings, uh, Willow had registered, she wasn't allowed to speak. Um, so that it just like kept happening, right? Um, I feel like they were so, 
it was so obvious what was happening because the uh, Family Research Council uh, would have reserved seating to to um, to be in the front lines and to keep community members out. So it, it was it was pretty painful to be there and like listen to listen to them say all those things about us, say all those things about trans youth, um, with such little regards to the people that they're supposed to be representing. Um, and I want to speak for everybody else, but I definitely for myself, I feel like it wasn't, it was an extra layer of like trauma endured by having to sit there and listen to it um, and continue to show up. You know, I think it was really difficult to have to sit there, listen to them, not curse them out, not attack them, uh, still try to like be reasonable in your in your um, your argument that you were making against these bills, and and have them like disregard all, all of that, and then have to go home, and then come back again and like try to do it again, knowing that they didn't care, right? So I would say it was a lot of. Um, emotional, um, psychological abuse by the legislation um, against trans people and and uh, cisgender people with transgender loved ones. Willow, uh, would, would you like to kind of add anything to that uh, uh, on your personal experiences? Um, yeah, and I know, um, and I know, you and I also went to go talk to the governor too, which was a, a very nerve-wracking experience, at least for me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, just to kind of follow up on what Roomba said, like that was honestly um, one of the hardest two months I've ever had to endure. It was really terrible. It was really dehumanizing. You know, I was at the Capitol almost every day and it was just like, every time I would wake up to go to the Capitol, I would just be like, oh God, like it was just, it was so dreadful and terrible and like the complete, like utter disrespect towards all the trans people that would be in the committee meetings and stuff. Like Rimba said, it was honestly like, it was just exhausting and it was just another like added layer of like trauma it was really terrible and you know we spent two months like being at the capitol almost every day and um, on top of that like juggling all these news interviews um like there was like a five day period where I did probably like eight news interviews a day and it was so exhausting I have to tell my story over and over again and you know, we're just sitting here like begging for our rights and we're not even allowed to speak for more than two minutes while they've let these like extremely like transphobic, homophobic people sit up there and speak for like an hour. And uh, we're, I, I, you know, and I know I, I've talked to this, uh, to this dad, he's a dad of a trans youth and, and he was in the news, he was in national news uh, because he was arrested by the Capitol Police. I think it was the Capitol Police for going over his two minute time limit. Were either of y'all uh, present when that happened? Yes, uh, we were. Um, I think both of us are present when that happened. And honestly, um, I was really here for it to see like a cis person, like really put themselves in the way of harm um, to fight for trans people. I was like, I want to see more of this. Like. Um, you know, I want to see cis people going out of their way to um, disrupt those spaces at the Capitol and be like, no, we're not going to stand for this because, you know, we're not going to be able to get our liberation without our allies. And that's not saying we can't hold our allies accountable to being competent for us, but we can also mobilize our allies to use them as tools for our own liberation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, and what... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I can add just that, um, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't being aggressive. He wasn't like, I think that folks sometimes think that um, we show up to just disrupt, right? Or to like cause chaos or like this direct action type thing that like we sometimes do and it freaks people out. But he literally was just sitting there speaking. If folks haven't seen that video, like you should see it. He was just sitting there speaking. Actually, Willow and I were sitting like right behind him. And they yeah. just came over. And um, that reminded me that 
you know, at every committee hearing, there was an overwhelming amount of police presence. Um, they were always watching us. They were following us when we would walk around like the hallways. Uh, we did get kicked out the first time, right, Willow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, you don't see that at any other committee hearing, but they ensure that there would be an overwhelming amount of police officers that would follow us around and just to intimidate wow. us. Wow. Not only that, but on multiple occasions when we were walking past them, they would make comments about us talking about how they were ready to arrest people and how they wish we would like act up. And honestly, the more we showed up, the more we mobilized people, the more people we showed up with, the more police that came. And every time it was such an increase in police every single time we went. Wow. Wow. That's really disturbing to hear. Um, you know, and, and just to, you know, and, you know, when they're even, I, I would say what, you know, when they're even willing to arrest a, you know, a cisgender white male uh, who's, you know, standing up, you know, for trans people, for, for his own trans youth, um, you know, I'm sure that they're even more ready to, uh, you know, arrest people from uh, more marginalized communities. And that's really unfortunate. Um, well, I mentioned this uh, a little previously. After the legislature passed HB 1570, um, uh, one of the state reps, uh, Nicole Clowney, uh, set up a meeting with Governor Hutchinson to talk to trans people before he made a decision on it. Um, and you and I, uh, she set up for, for you and I to, to, to meet with the governor. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you felt uh, I know, I know it was incredibly nerve wracking for me um, coming out of that meeting. How did you feel? Um, you know, I felt Asa was like very receptive, but honestly, it was difficult for me at the time because, you know, I'm sitting here trying to humanize myself, trying to beg for this legislation to not get passed that will ultimately raise suicide rates and harm trans kids. And it, it was, it just felt very weird. <laughs> like honestly and um yeah you know it was kind of like discombobulating a little to see someone being like so nice to me and like um but knowing that they just pass bills that are actively like harming my community and so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it was uh um I had no idea coming out of that meeting room at the end I still had no idea what he was gonna do um and honestly I was I was, I was actually surprised that he did issue the veto. Um, I, had, I guess I had convinced myself in my head that, um, you know, that, that he wasn't gonna do it. So I was really surprised when he did. Um, you know, and of course my anxiety level was just ramped up uh, to 11 uh, because I was like replaying in my head every answer that I'd given him because I was like, you know, oh, did I, did I answer that question? you know, exactly the right way. And, and did I screw it up for trans kids in Arkansas and possibly other states uh, because I didn't answer a question the right way? Uh, it was a lot of pressure. Yeah, it definitely was. <laughs> so, but you did, you did great in that meeting. You really, you really did. Thank um, you. You did as well. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to kind of, you know, open up the question a little bit. Um, you know, let's talk about, uh, you know, how, how does this, you know, you know, you, and Willow, you're, you're deaf and Roomba too, you're, you're both hearing from people on the ground, I have as well, um, how this legislation is affecting folks in the community right now. Um, to my knowledge, this legislation hasn't taken place yet. So, yeah. um, you know, trans kids are still receiving their care. I know some doctors, um, they're trying to get at least like six months supplies because there are pharmacies that can dispense a six month supply of hormones. Um, so I've heard that um, kind of being talked about and put into play. Um, you know, but ultimately the families that aren't leaving Arkansas are making plans to go to doctors in Memphis and surrounding states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Roomba, what, um, you know, even, even though these, these laws, you know, if they hopefully, you know, if they're not going to get, if they don't get blocked by the courts, they would go into effect on, on July 28th. 
um, but even though they're not yet in effect, um, I know it's caused a lot of fear and anxiety. Um, you know, and I wanted to kind of um, ask you what, what, you know, what you've been hearing and what people have been sharing with you. Um, yeah, I think even though they haven't gone into effect, they still, they're, they're still affecting people, right? Like just the mm -hmm. fact that like it was put out that way, uh, just knowing that like Arkansas is willing to go this far because even Texas didn't go that far, you know, like there were things that were, that were veto and the veto stood in Texas in a way that like Arkansas couldn't. So just like knowing that, like the message that it sends, um, for some folks that have shared um, just like the surfacing of trauma, especially um, like hate crimes, people who have experienced hate crimes. And then this is a state sponsored hate crime um, against trans folks, especially against trans kids. But so it has resurfaced like trauma for folks to, um, to have gone through the session and like be constantly like hearing about it or like be present um, at the committee hearings or um, be, you know, like seeing it online and whatnot. Um, and then for other folks, it has been the fear of like, will the courts actually rule in our favor? You know, and if it, there's no way to know that. And so the time is taken to like get out. Um, so we've had a couple of like families reach out who have been, um, who are planning on moving out of the state um, and have been just trying to fundraise you know, trying to get out um, for the sake of their kids. And then um, I think for the other, like some youth that we've been um, meeting with, it's just been more about like finding space. Uh, their parents have shared just like, just wanting to have trans youth be around like other trans folks um, as a way to like not feel so isolated. Um, so I would say all of these things are like, are highlighted by this legislative session, you know? So like, even though these things haven't gone into effect, these laws haven't like mm -hmm. actually started like being enforced, it's still causing, I would say primarily a lot of um, emotional, like psychological trauma on folks. And then the financial strain, because, you know, there are folks who are able to, to, uh, to afford getting a six month supply, but there are folks who are not able to do that. Um, and they need that financial support just to be able to stock up. So those are just some of the things that have um, come out from folks reaching out. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, it, it's heartbreaking to hear, you know, people, families have to make the decision of having to uproot their entire lives and move out of the state, um, you know, because of, basically hate mongering. Um, you know, uh, for my part, I've been hearing from uh, parents of, of trans youth uh, who, are, who, are, who are angry. Um, you know, they're angry, they're scared, um, you know, they're uncertain about what's gonna happen. Um, and, and they feel like they've been demonized. Uh, they feel like they're, you know, one of the talking points of the, the folks pushing this legislation was that, uh, that uh, this was somehow equivalent to letting their kids uh, smoke or drink or get a tattoo or something like that, um, which is really a false comparison because none of that is healthcare. And, um, you know, these parents really feel like, um, uh, you know, in order to get especially the healthcare bill passed, uh, that they, they've, you know, that they're collateral damage in a way. They, they've been painted as if they are, um, you know, bad, pa negligent parents. Um, and they're really angry about that, um, you know, because that's really not the case. They're trying to do, uh, you know, as any parent would, what's, you know, they're trying to do anything uh, for their kids. They're trying to do what's, what's best for their families. And, um, you know, for them to be, to be painted as villains, I think is, uh, has been especially uh, hurtful and damaging for these families. Um, I want to uh, kind of move on to uh, to our next topic here, um, basically talking about um, invisibility, um, you know, which is which is one way to kind of change hearts and minds. Uh, in recent years, uh, there's been a rise of 
uh, trans visibility in pop culture. Um, it, you know, in Hollywood, uh, Elliot Page is probably the most famous trans person now in Hollywood, uh, came out this year. Um, uh, you know, hugely popular TV shows like Pose, um, you know, which, you know, millions of people have watched. Uh, you know, in this latest season, there are some flashback scenes uh, that show several of the characters as trans youth. Um, the reality show I Am Jazz, uh, which is about a trans youth and her family, uh, is run for six seasons, and I think it's about to come back for a seventh season. Uh, there's shows like Euphoria and Saved by the Bell. Uh, both of them portray trans teenagers. And importantly, the characters in both of those shows uh, are played by actresses who really did transition as teenagers in real life. Uh, we know that visibility in media is uh, important to help educate, inspire, and aspire. Um, for older people, uh, you know, uh, in often cases, uh, they get to know trans people for the first time through pop culture. Uh, for younger people, uh, it, you know, it provides role models and possibility models uh, to look up to. And so uh, I'm going to direct this first uh, question over to Hannah. Uh, you know, in pop culture and in other forms of art in general, uh, you know, even with this increase in visibility, what, what narratives and ideas do you feel are still missing uh, in the broader representation of trans communities? Uh, thank you, Evelyn. I, I think just to, to cover it all, it's just like we're, we're missing everything. And that comes down to we don't have a primary or a, a wide enough um, platform as um, trans people to speak about the issues and, and path forward that is, that is needed for us to actually live our lives with that unencumbered. Um, we have this idea, at least in Arkansas, at least in like the United States, that trans people are, I guess, demonic or like bad as tattoos in that way. Um, that comes from the representation that people have digested from movies and TV shows leading up until this generation. They have all been negative, at least up until 1997, with some positive changes. Um, that's, and I, th I think what's missing most of all is for trans representation to be, um, you know, profitable for people to pick up on. Uh, an early example I gave was Juliana Huxtable. Her work is not visible um, because she is a queer black trans woman and it is not profitable for her to sell her work um, because it goes against the grain. Um, and so you either have to know someone or you have to go out there and look for the information to understand what's happening. Um, and unless you're a trans person, that becomes very hard to advocate for yourself because you're having to explain yourself over and over and over again, instead of just people just understanding well, we're not there yet. Um, so the path forward for um, representation is just to have a platform and that involves money and uh, resources. So. Exactly. Um, Ruben Willow, um, you know, as, as trans people and, and Roomba as a trans person of color as well, um, you know, what are your thoughts on representation? What's missing? Um, so I think to start off with, um, you know, we have seen like a, over the past like two, three years, like a lot of um, good representation for trans people. And I feel like with Pose and with Euphoria specifically, like these are shows that are really not catered to like a cis view and are more catered to like the community itself. And, um, you know, that's why we've seen like a huge like popularity in these shows. It's because, you know, for a lot of like young LGBT people, like, we don't get to see that as kids. We don't get to see like real experiences and like multifaceted characters beyond like the white cis gay man friend to like this popular girl in movies and stuff. Like, you know, we don't get these real experiences where like trans people are the main characters and um, their stories are like multifaceted and just real and not like polished perfect. Like, 
it's just like real stories or not they like you know they're fictional but um mm -hmm. like I feel like a lot of those experiences like people can relate to but you know the frequency of this media is not enough like you know we don't see enough of this like we have euphoria pose um like generation shows like that but like you know, I can name like three or four or five off the top of my head, like how many shows can and movies can you name that are about like cis relationships and like cis love, like countless, like countless, countless, countless. Exactly. Um, Roomba, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, the first thing that always comes up for me is love. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because I you know, I'm, I'm not sure how old Hannah is, but I'm, I'm older than Willow for sure. And, um, and, you know, like definitely, I don't know. The thing that like, I felt like I've heard a lot, um, especially when I like had come out is that um, trans people are never going to be loved. Um, I know like loved ones told me that, you know, when I was coming out, mm -hmm. uh, other trans people told me that like, we're just meant to be alone, right? Like nobody's ever going to love trans folks. Um, and so like being able to see that and see it in a way that isn't um, so cis-centric to where like, is the cis person like coming to save the day and like love a trans person? Um, I would love to see that. I would love to see like, even like some messy movies like uh, The Breakup, you know, where like, if it was like trans and you get to see like trans people breaking up and um, you know, and like growing and whatnot, you know, um, like funny, funny things where like trans people are just trans and it, the story doesn't revolve around like just being trans. Um, but for me also like, I wanna see trans people in novelas you know, like I grew up watching novelas with my great grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, it's what taught me a lot about how to be dramatic, honestly. And and I want to see that. I want to I want to be able to say like, oh, that actress or that uh, act, yeah, that actress or actor um, or actress six. I'm trying to think of just the <laughs> form of it. Um, it's like really well known in the novela world, you know. Um, I would like to see that uh, for sure. And I think that part of the narratives that are missing um, are also around um, the other intersections of transness. Um, you know, what it's like to, to uh, not have access to healthcare at all, um, to not be able to have access to healthcare at all, what it's like to be an immigrant and not have um, even an idea of how you navigate the U.S. and then you have to figure out that you're trans and then you have to figure out like how do you access these things when um, especially if you're undocumented you you don't have access to like uh, the Affordable Care Act right or anything like that. Um, yeah everything that like all the other intersections of it mm -hmm. um, being like coming from like conservative families or I don't know. Um, also being, um, having been married and then coming out once you're already married and what like, you know, like what that looks like. Um, yeah, everything that doesn't like necessarily sell as and I was saying, <laughs> the stuff that people might not be like, ooh, uh, you know, Elliot Page uh, coming out with a six pack. Um, everything like beyond that, I would like to see all of that. Yeah, thank you, Rupa. I, you know, definitely you, you touched on some really good points, love stories, um, you know, and then, you know, stories that include, I think some of the, some of the barriers uh, that people don't really know about or don't think of, um, you know, but, um, you know, I do think that that I do think that there is a market for, for authentic storytelling. I think that, that when, you know, people see those authentic stories um, portrayed in media, in art, um, you know, in literature even, and things like that, um, you know, I, I think that they can, they can really resonate with people on a level beyond being cis and trans. Um, 
you know, because, uh, you know, there are a lot of very specific barriers to the trans community, but I think that there's also a lot of universality as well. Um, you know, it'd be great to see a messy, <laughs> like you said, a messy love story um, that involves where the character happens to be trans and it's not necessarily revolves around that. You know, um, I know that, you know, in literature, um, as a writer, uh, for many years, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the early literature was all about um, uh, biographies and, and personal narratives and things like that. And then um, really, you know, as we got into the 90s, a lot of the focus was really on transition stories. Um, but, you know, transition is a very specific period of time. And there's a whole life that happens after that. Uh, and a whole, you know, and during that as well, there's, there's, <laughs> there's other things that happen. Um, that are incidental. So yeah, I think a lot more, a lot more art can be made, a lot more visibility. Um, I'm happy for that there are artists out there like Hannah as well. Um, and so that kind of leads me into, uh, into our next uh, sort of topic here, uh, which is um, what impacts can art uh, and community organizing uh, make for trans people? Um, so this is going to be kind of a round robin, uh, you know, for for anyone to jump in on. Um, but maybe we, I want to start again with Hannah um, about the impact of art. Um, thank you. Um, for me personally, like just just being an artist, like the most. Um, I, I I've been asked to join like so many like um, shows, but when I look at the prospects is usually I'm the only trans artist and so when it comes to like what is what is needed in, in the the art world as well as like the the community the uh general just um sorry I lost my train of thought when it comes to like community organizing is that we need to be like working together and for my own personal opinion being radical and um because when it comes to asking for your rights, asking to be treated as human, you don't do that nicely. You have to sometimes make it um, awkward just so people will actually hear you and not just misunderstand you. And the uh, Juliana Huxville Castles, Zachary Drucker, they all do it in a way that is, is approachable. These artists that have been able to speak not only for themselves, but about community issues within the trans community. They are all um, very, very personal and very heightened. So when you come away from those art pieces, you have a changed perspective. Um, and I think just with moving forward with community organizing as well as art, uh, not only for myself, but just for uh, trans artists or trans producers, trans influencers, it needs to be more direct with how they get to the next step. Um, and then as round robin like popcorn. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, we can open it up to, to to Ruben Willow to talk yes. about, uh, you know, art and community organizing. Okay, yes. And the difference it can make you know, for improving mm. trans lives. Yes. Um, I think that like, when we're talking about like community organizing, which makes me think of like movement work, um, art and movement work like have gone hand in hand like for generations, right? Um, and I think in Arkansas Center for Artistic Revolution is that great example of that of like where art had met community organizing and has been used to like create these narratives um so i definitely like, think art is is the way that we that we uh, create narratives and put the narratives out um to be able to change or to be able to fill this uh, the lack of uh representation that we were talking about before right like the stories that don't get told um and I think community organizing is the reason why um, why there was a fight against this legislative session in Arkansas. It was community organizing that um, made thousands of calls to the to the legislators and to and to uh, ASA. It was community organizing that uh, made sure that there were folks at the committee hearings like testifying. 
It was community organizing that show up to the rallies. It was community organizing that like, um, that caused the veto. I think it was folks mobilizing in all sorts of ways. It was that community coming together. Um, it just wasn't enough to fight like the amount of power and money that was coming from out of the state to like influence it here. Um, and I think that that's just like probably another conversation, but um, but um, I, I think community organizing is what causes change. You know, community organizing is what um, what um, what can what can ensure that these laws don't actually like get enforced. Um, and the art component of it, the the art in a larger sense, right? Like how folks think of art and like museums and things like that. Um, I think that needs to, needs to be able to tell the stories of the uh, of that organizing, not just the stories of like what it's like to be trans and blah blah blah, but what it's like to be trans and resist. Like who has been resisting for years in the state, um, and and what are the narratives that those people have been pushing so that folks with these larger larger platforms uh, with art can like uplift those narratives or like, I don't know, collaborate to like put out these narratives more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. And you know, I think we, and I'm starting to see more of the shift, but I think there's a huge need for a shift in community organizing that, you know, um, goes from just sharing like trauma and like having this like idealist view of like, you know, we can um, save ourselves by lobbying and doing all this and meeting with these people. And like, if we can just get this power and influence, like we can change this for ourselves and like move more towards like a material reality point of view, you know, um, there's so many, um, queer and trans people, specifically black and brown queer and trans people that are unhoused, that don't have access to food, that don't have access to health care. And like, you know, those are very basic things that everyone should have access to. And, you know, I think there really needs to be more of a focus on like housing programs, on like getting food to people, getting all these things that people need and making them accessible. And not only that, but stop advocating for communities you're not a part of, you know, really centering the voices of the people who are oppressed and um, sharing platforms. You know, there are people with such huge platforms that have the ability to be like, okay, you can take over this platform and use this platform to do this work. And there's just not enough of that. And yeah, <laughs> I lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I, you know, I, you brought up some really good points. Um, you know, uh, not enough of, uh, I think toward the end, basically you're kind of talking about not, not enough of centering trans voices or speaking or speak, um, other voices speaking over trans voices. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was a, um, you know, uh, there was a, a media, media Matters for America uh, put out a study that, uh, you know, the, the Democrat Gazette, uh, you know, during, uh, you know, uh, the coverage of all these uh, bills in the legislative session, um, that there were multiple articles that, uh, you know, written about the bills where they didn't quote uh, a single trans person in an article that was all about legislation that affected trans people. Uh, you know, they got uh, quotes from, from legislators on one side and legislators on the other side uh, who were all you know, for the most part, white cisgender people, uh, you know, and, and leaving out the voices of the people who would be directly affected. Um, Ruba, I think you brought up a, you know, a kind of a good point I, I kind of wanted to, to touch on is that, yeah, it was, it was some very well-funded, um, very well-funded out-of-state groups uh, that were pushing these bills and, uh, you had that on one side, and on the other side, uh, you had, you know, what I would consider, you know, kind of chronically underfunded, uh, you know, groups who are here inside Arkansas. And so I think that, um, 
you know, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, with, with greater visibility is going to come, you know, a greater support um, for, you know, groups that are uh, working for, um, as Willow mentioned, the material realities, the material needs of, of trans people that are led by trans people, uh, you know, and, and to kind of wind it out into a broader context, um, you know, obviously, you know, trans people aren't the only people in the state, uh, you know, who, who need food assistance, who need housing assistance, um, you know, who, who have problems with educational access, um, you know, but I, but I think that, that obviously when we're designing and developing, uh, you know, programs and services uh, that help trans people uh, achieve those basic needs, uh, we're going to be helping lots of other people achieve basic needs as well, you know, and that's going to, that's, to me, is going to be a benefit, a wider benefit as well. Um, you know, and, and one final point I wanted to put on that um, with, in, in terms of community organizing, um, uh, because of the greater visibility um, for trans youth, because they have been under such attack this year, um, one silver lining, if I can even call it that, um, is that uh, the parents, the, the, the accepting parents of these kids, um, who previous to this were, a lot of them were isolated in their own individual communities. Um, they may have had some friends and family uh, who, were, who were empathetic, um, you know, to what them and, and you know, and their kids were going through and raising a trans youth, um, but weren't necessarily directly experiencing, uh, you know, what they were going through 100%. Um, because of, you know, ironically, because of the attacks by the legislature, these families have now started all finding each other throughout the state for the first time and connecting with each other for the very first time and organizing. Um, there's there's multiple parent groups now um, that are now connected to each other, that are now organizing with each other. And I think that's really powerful. Um, you know, so if there's one inadvertent good thing that's come out of this, um, you know, that's one of them. I do agree with that as well, because, you know, through this legislation and how highly publicized it's been, we have seen people like come out in huge numbers. Like we've been able to mobilize so many people to come help us fight this legislation. And even though it wasn't successful, it really um, lit a fire under a lot of these people to be like, you know what, I should be doing more. I shouldn't just come out during the legislative season. And we've been able to stay in contact with those people. And, you know, those people have been reaching out and supporting us and uplifting our work and giving us money so we can continue the work. And I feel like that has been like a really important thing. And it was also just really beautiful to see all these people come out and show up for trans folks. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, did anyone have any anything to to um, add on this topic before we move on to um, the next one? Okay, uh, so I wanted to move on to to our next topic, um, which is kind of a, a little bit connected to this. Um, you know, we know that you know we've we've talked about this already in this in this trans people. Uh, are a small and, and pretty vulnerable group, especially trans youth, especially trans people of color. Um, you know, it's a population that's vulnerable to things like family rejection, harassment, discrimination, self-harm, violence. Um, you know, research has shown that many of the very things that the Arkansas legislature um, is trying to ban uh, have, have benefits for trans youth, psychological well-being, a sense of belonging, lower risk of self-harm, uh, higher GPAs, greater likelihood to attend college. Um, you know, so with so much of the, so much of the dialogue centering around the first part, the trans trauma, what does it mean to center transgender joy? Um, and I wanted to start by directing this question to Willow, 
uh, and maybe sh you can share some of the ways uh, that you're working with the Young Trans Women Project and seeing uh, folks exhibit resilience in the face of all this, if they are. Yeah, so right now our main focus has been just outreach and um, talking to other trans girls and seeing what type of programming they want as we're working right now to establish like more solid programming and stuff. Um, but, you know, with money that we've gotten in donations and grants we've received, we've been able to give out, I think, like over $4,000 in emergency funds, which has been really helpful. And, you know, um, I feel like there needs to be more focus about giving, there needs to be more focus on giving money directly to trans women, specifically black and brown trans women, because when trans women's needs are met, they're able to show up as their more authentic selves. They're able to show up and organize. And um, not only that, but these are things that should be being met anyways. And there needs to be more of a push to give money that's not restricted, money that doesn't have any stipulations. So trans women can pay their bills, get food, you know, get the things that they need. And yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yes, it's, that's, you know, it's, it's super important to get those, those material needs met. And unfortunately that needs to be, uh, it, it's not enough of the focus of the conversation. Um, you know, uh, you know, we're having to respond to these rid ridiculous attacks on things like healthcare and, and um, you know, uh, uh, inclusion in sports and bathrooms and things like that. When, when the bigger needs uh, are being left out of the conversation entirely, um, like you mentioned, housing, um, you know, house, housing, healthcare access in general, um, and things like that. Um, so I, I wanted to, to, to bring Hannah in. Uh, what does it mean to you to center, to center trans joy in the dialogue? Um, I don't get a lot of chances for joy when it comes to being a, a trans woman. Um, I do think about the successes we've had in the community just when it comes to you know trans people out in the world succeeding and they're being recognized we've had a lot of people elected um, to government bodies that are trans we've had people in the media who are being recognized and celebrated um and and i think about you know trans artists that that inspire me like people like zachary drucker and rise ernst who created an entire book about their eight year relationship and how it was a success. Like those images of two trans people being loved and loving each other. Like that's something I discovered going into not knowing what it would be like, you know, terrified and scared of how I would be seen. And here I have um, two people who are succeeding. Um, I, I want to see more narratives like that, and, and they're starting to come out, but not fast enough for me, so. Um. Thank you. Um, yeah. Roomba, I want to pass it to you, Roomba. Um, I think of, I'm trying to think of like the right, or how to say it in English. <laughs> um, or maybe like that, like creation, like things that trans people create, um, you know, like art, right? Like to be able to, to have the story that is coming out, like have that be the center instead of like the actual struggle and the struggle of, of that person uh, or of that group, um, have it be like an attachment to it, if that makes sense. So like, um, like uh like i'm thinking of brody right like i think all of y'all know brody but brody is a poet and uh and they like have published like a couple books um or have been published in a couple books and so um what is like that's what brody brody's producing right so like to center like brody's joy i would say from somebody who knows them is to like be able to like uplift what they created so like their poetry right like the the books that they created and the books in which they've been published 
and maybe the struggle that like gets attached to that is that um, they don't get as as much platform as like their cisgender counterparts, right? Um, and so I'm uplifting like the joy of it, which is like they created this. And I'm also letting you know that like, these are the struggles of it that you can like help alleviate in like whichever way you have, right? And redistributing funds. Um, I also think of like, like in, in relation to movement. So like nowadays, um, a lot of us are uh, post things around like Marsha P. Johnson or like Sylvia Rivera or Miss Major who's still alive, right? Of like, look, look what all these uh, trans women like have done. Right and um, and and it's great because like they definitely need the recognition. I just wonder like what would it have been like had they gotten that recognition like back then, right? And had would that have alleviated a lot of the like the struggles that come with it um, to be able to like share what they're doing? And so that leads me to think of like what are the trans people like here and what have, what are those trans folks doing? What are those trans folks creating? Not just in the art world, but in the movement world. And um, how do you share that? How do you uplift it now that like folks are in the struggle, right? So that along with that joy of what they're creating of what we're creating comes the struggle and you can like alleviate the struggle because you're seeing like the fun part of it. Um, and the last thing that comes to mind is like TikTok. I love <laughs> TikTok. I spend way too many hours on TikTok. And, uh, and I'm definitely just on like queer trans TikTok, right? Like pretty much like queer, black and brown, like trans TikTok. Um, and, uh, and it's been great to just see like trans people being funny or trans people like sharing like I got this job or like look at a new move that I learned or like, oh my gosh, I finally dumped this like terrible person. <laughs> um, so that's another part of like, like uplifting trans joy or like centering trans joy for me is to um, devote a couple of hours to TikTok and make sure that I <laughs> heart their stuff, that I follow, that I comment, that I share to be able to uplift their platforms. Um, cause a lot of folks are able to like subsidize like needs around, um, income based on that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, we're running a little bit behind, um, but I want to move on to, to our last, uh, question, um, which is what is everyone's thoughts on how we can prevent another round of legislation like this from happening again? What needs to happen? Uh, and Willow, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, could you actually come back to me? I'm sorry. That's, that's okay. That's okay. Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and kind of give some of my prompts. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I have a lot, I have a long list of, of things that I think ne need to happen, uh, debunking myths. And a lot of that comes with addressing misinformation and education educating the public. I think there's a lot of people in the middle who don't know what the right answer is. And I think with education will come awareness. Um, asking, you know, uh, holding elected officials accountable at the ballot box, holding companies accountable for their campaign donations, um, tearing down this us versus them sort of dichotomy, um, funding underfunded organizations, uh, capacity building and things like that. Um, those are some of my thoughts of, of what needs to happen to, to build a more uh, kind of resilient, um, you know, uh, 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 allies, you know, resilience for trans people and resilience uh, for our allies. Um, those are my thoughts. Um, Roomba or, or Hannah, do either of you wanna uh, kind of jump in on this question? What needs to happen? I love this question. I love the ideas you shared. I basically have three. If I had a, a, a perfect situation, if I was able to control the situation, it would be like actually counting trans persons. There's no census um, um, for counting trans persons in the United States. So we actually don't know like, you know, how many people are out there, how many people are, um, you know, 
paying their taxes, how many people are in which districts and which county, how much funds are going to those populations. And we also don't know how many people are being taken away from us through violence. So we weren't able to create initiatives to stop um, things like murder or um, income equality or any of those situations, mostly the violence. But the second thing uh, and third thing is, is money and, and representation. If you have money, um, that's a tool that makes the world go round and that makes these communities and um, voices heard. Um, same thing with representation. If you have a, a platform, if you have a way to share and to make people care, to share that perspective and way of, of seeing, it, sh just sharing empathy, then share these stories. Um, those are the three things that I think will lead to like maybe a possible bright future. Um, yeah. I love it. Ruba? Um, yeah, I think we need more infrastructure. I think that's the reason why we didn't, we weren't able to beat it because the infrastructure doesn't exist in Arkansas in the way that exists in other, in other states of the South. Mm -hmm. Like just speaking of the South, right? Um, I know like every time I've gone out of Arkansas and like movement related spaces, folks are surprised that there are trans people in Arkansas, especially trans people of color in Arkansas. Um, so going to where, what Hannah was saying around just like not knowing how many trans people are in Arkansas, right? Um, but I think Arkansas has been forgotten, but just like the South in general, I mean, the country as a whole, but like the South as well, um, where funders decide to put their money and that's what we're, the lack of infrastructure comes. And in thinking of infrastructure, as somebody who like, you know, grew up in Northwest Arkansas and then like has been living in Little Rock um, for a couple of years now, just there is such inequality in the, in the state of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Everything stays in Northwest Arkansas. All the money, uh, all the infrastructure that exists around LGBTQ issues is in Northwest Arkansas. Um, so when you think of how this fight went on, uh, in the legislative session, as Willow was saying, like, and she was pretty much there every day. <laughs> and there are people that are very, pretty much there every day. Um, and so those were people who lived here in Little Rock. Those were people who are like yeah. are in central Arkansas, where we don't have the infrastructure that Northwest Arkansas has. So I think in what I think what difference would it have made if the LGBTQ orgs, especially the trans orgs here in central Arkansas, in Northeast Arkansas, in like Southern Arkansas, had the infrastructure that Northwest Arkansas organizations have. Um, I think yeah. it would have made a huge difference, you know? So I think, do we, how do we prevent this is the infrastructure. We need to have a more equitable state um, as organizations. And we know that we can work together. We did it this legislative session, mm -hmm. right? There were organizations from all around the state who were meeting, we were meeting on a regular basis and we were fighting together. Um, so being able to keep more of that but definitely the infrastructure, the infrastructure to be able to send text messages to people um, who can, you know, be asked to create, to do an action, to mobilize, to make calls, to like do all that. Those are things that organizations in other states of the South have that Arkansas doesn't. Um, so again, just that infrastructure, uh, sharing that wealth from Northwest Arkansas to the rest of the state, mm -hmm. um, which translates us money, right? But it also translates us like, um, community organizing, people power, people volunteering, people sharing resources and whatnot. I think that I think that we can do it together. You know, we can prevent it um, if we just keep sticking together. Yeah. Solidarity and infrastructure, both super important. Um, Willow, quickly, I wanted to circle back to you to see if you had any thoughts. Uh, otherwise, we'll go on to the to the Q&A. Sorry, I was muted. Um, you know, I think also a big thing to know is, you know, organizing is my job. Most people aren't able to show up every day during the middle of the day, during like typical work hours and stuff. So, you know, that was kind of also a challenge that a lot of people weren't able to come. You know, as much people as we did get to show up, there's so many more people that would have been able to come and stuff, but because of work and like other um, obstacles. So, you know, it, 
organizing is not always like the most convenient thing <laughs> um, because, you know, we're working around so many people's different schedules and stuff. And there's so many barriers that um, exist to keep people from coming to actions and stuff, you know, like a lot of work is centralized in Little Rock or Northwest and nothing outside of that. And, you know, we don't see a lot of like rural work happening or rural movements in Arkansas um, like we do in other states and stuff. Um, just cause the, the people power isn't there necessarily and the money isn't there. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, getting getting the resources to where they're needed, um, you know, is going to be an ongoing challenge. Um, you know, we're we're running a little tight. Uh, I wanted to move on to uh, the Q and A. Um, I haven't seen any any Q and A in the chat, um, but I did have uh, something I wanted to bring up. I've had several uh, community members reach out to me uh, through social media um, and through private conversations. Um, to uh, basically ex express uh, some concern that uh, Crystal Bridges and the momentary uh, do not yet offer a fully trans-inclusive healthcare benefits. And uh, folks have asked me if this could be uh, addressed uh, during the panel. Uh, so I wanted to um, just uh, ask our hosts uh, if you could address that question uh, uh, briefly. Thank you, Evelyn. And uh, really this whole conversation, um, thank you all again so much for talking on all of these different topics. And, um, you know, I just, I really, I, to me, I just the deep dive, I just again wanted to thank you all. Um, but for your question, uh, you know, I have spoken with our people services department uh, to uh, discuss inclusive healthcare for everyone at the museum and for staff and uh, trans inclusive healthcare uh, and from people services and what I've also spoken to our executive director is they currently are in an evaluation process in looking at our healthcare benefits uh, and for all staff at Crystal Bridges uh, regardless of identity uh, everyone has access to the health benefits one of the uh, benefits that is not included is the gender reassignment surgery and that is something that uh, people services uh, is currently evaluating uh, and so um, I there will be more news coming soon okay thank you Sarah for for uh, being direct and, and answering that and, and um, you know, uh, one thing I wanted to add, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I personally feel that um, I am where I am today, uh, in part uh, because I had trans inclusive healthcare benefits uh, in my workplace. Um, I had them when I worked, I worked for uh, almost uh, 20 years for ABC Disney. And so I had them, when I was there, I transitioned on the job. Um, Disney started offering uh, fully trans-inclusive healthcare benefits in 2006. Uh, and I was one of the first people in line. Um, and, you know, that was 15 years ago. Uh, and Disney, Disney was not the first company uh, to start offering those benefits. Um, you know, and I, I just wanted to um, to allow the, uh, our other uh, panelists if they had any, any thoughts about trans-inclusive healthcare at all since we're on this topic. I have a few thoughts. Um, I, I actually came to the University of Arkansas because they offered trans-inclusive benefits and I started my transition when I started school. Um, so I was going through grad school as well as going through um, hormone changes. Same thing with after that, I found a job that offered health care that provided for trans care. And that's at, though it was at Starbucks. Right now at my new job, I am trying to advocate for health care that focuses on trans um, uh, medical coverages. And that's um, been an uphill climb it, it's not everywhere, and um, if it's if it's not offered, it makes things a lot harder to get your work done because you're distracted by trying to find a way to get by. Um, so businesses and uh, companies that offer trans healthcare 
coverage, it, it helps um, so, so much. Um, Oh yeah, if I could just follow up on that too. Um, I just wanna talk about how expensive, even with insurance um, surgeries are in particular, because I'm going through the process right now of getting gender confirmation surgery. And it's not just the surgery, you know, it's the consultation fees, it's the laser hair removal and electrolysis, you know, which is very expensive. And, um, you know, hormones, like if you have insurance, they're really not that expensive, but you know, if you don't have insurance, like they're not one of the most expensive drugs, but it definitely adds up. And, you know, for a lot of people, that, that's just not accessible. And, you know, gender confirmation surgery um, is like one of the more readily covered surgeries, but, you know, surgeries for like breasts and other um, like trans affirming surgeries are a lot of times not covered by insurance and are a lot harder to get covered. Yeah, I've never had a job that offer trans inclusive healthcare. Um, and as a result, you know, haven't been able to access um, gender affirming surgeries. And um, I think that I think the thing is that folks think of gender affirming so cisgender folks think of gender affirming surgeries as um, something that is like in addition to, you know, like like a perk. Of, of your healthcare um, instead of just thinking like it's literally just healthcare. So, you know, to be, to have, com to have complete access to healthcare is to have complete access to surgeries that you need, right? And, um, and for a lot of trans folks, those surgeries are needed. So if I needed, um, I don't know, a kidney transplant, right? And and your insurance like didn't offer like kidney transplants, then your insurance didn't offer like proper healthcare for anyone. Um, so I think it just, if folks would stop thinking of like trans healthcare and like trans healthcare needs as like this additional thing, um, instead of just like, it's just healthcare we have this like particular need that maybe you don't have. There are folks who have like PCOS, right? And so they need like specific like specialists. Um, but how messed up would it be for your insurance to be like, we don't cover PCOS? <laughs> um, yeah, so just, I wish that folks would think more of along, along those lines of like, it's literally trans care is like the healthcare that we need, the surgeries are included for some folks. So, um, yeah, just the, the, la, the that separation yeah. is what I think causes more or gives more room for folks to be able to say, not yet, we're not going to add it yet. Or like, you know, that's not necessary right now. I, I want to jump on, on in on that, not to cover, take up too much of the Q&A time, um, but along with tra trans health care. It also needs to be um, trans human resources, um, uh, things that you can go to to your employer and go like, hey, I'm having this situation um, and it involves trans issues. Um, having policies in place already, that's cheap, especially with human resources. It's the way to start with um, finding coverage within a company is approaching HR and asking you know, to create these policies. Um, and then I saved my time, so. <laughs> um, we did have uh, one person in the chat um, ask a question. I think that, um, you know, it, to me, it kind of dovetails with, with one of my um, goals, uh, which I think needs to happen, which is to address in some ways misinformation um, or, perhaps, or perhaps, you know, kind of partially incorrect information. Um, and the question is, uh, in the chat, um, the question is, how do you all feel about the thousands of adults and youth who have detransitioned? Um, and so I kind of wanted that to open that up for, for anyone to respond to. Um, I, I would say for my part, um, I, I, I don't think I would characterize it as thousands from the, uh, you know, all the, the literature that I've seen uh, it's, it's less than 1% of, of people who transitioned have detransitioned. Um, and I think, 
for my part, I feel like the, the, uh, I think it's, I think the sort of transition detransition sets up sort of a, uh, to me, a false dichotomy. Um, you know, there, there are some people who are in different places at different times in their life. Um, you know, and there's a lot of, um, you know, I, I think we don't allow enough people to, to be where they are, um, to when they are, but, but I wanted to open it up to, to the panel to see if anyone had any thoughts on that question. Oh, I can take this one. Sure. Um, so to me, this question does feel a little invalidating. So you can definitely let us know if that was not the intent of that question. But, you know, I wouldn't say that there's like thousands and thousands of people just like detransitioning, whatever that word even means, because, you know, I feel like gender is something that should be normalized that, you know, sometimes you try something, it may not work. Sometimes you identify as one gender and that may not fit you. So... <laughs> Like, you know, I don't feel like um, people who detransition or decide that an identity doesn't fit them or like doesn't work for them should delegitimize the trans people who um, have lived our lives as trans for like a long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there are folks who are uh, asking me to kind of wrap it up here because uh, we've run out of time. Uh, so I wanted to close out um, thanking everybody for your answers um, and just uh, do a quick round robin of uh, if you had to summarize your feeling in this moment uh, in one to three words, um, and we'll just kind of popcorn it. Um, I would, I'll say for me, I'm feeling hopeful. Um, Hannah? Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I uh, three words. Um, actually, wrote them down. Um, the way forward is probably radical, empathy, empathetic, and together. Um, Pass it to someone else. Yeah, uh, popcorn Roomba. Covered my mouth. Wow, calling me out like that. Uh, I was still trying to think of my words. Um, I feel um, humorous <laughs> and um, definitely hopeful and calm. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. And Willow. Um, I'm going to say um, I feel motivated by this conversation. I feel hopeful for what's to come after this conversation. And, um, you know, I feel supported. I feel like this conversation has kind of gained a lot of insight into how we can be like better connected as a community. So, yeah. Also, don't love those questions. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and, and I just wanted to point out, Willow, you are 18. Um, and so I think that, yes, I think maybe uh, the question was a little bit uh, invalidating. Um, but I wanted to, to thank all of you um, and, uh, and also thank Crystal Bridges uh, for your time. Um, and also uh, just highlight, um, you know, if people want to learn more information, there are several uh, Pride Month programs going on uh, by Northwest Arkansas Equality. You can go to their website, nwaequality.org. Um, also, there is the Pronouns uh, Trans Art Exhibit uh, that's open till the end of June uh, at Mount Sequoia. Uh, so you can look that up at, at the Mount Sequoia Center in Fayetteville. Um, so I wanted to bring back uh, Sarah and Lucero. Well, again, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here. And uh, Lucero, do you have any any final thoughts or mess something you'd like to share? <laughs> Thank you uh, for letting me be a part of this. I really appreciate it. I couldn't have asked for a better group to have done this discussion with. 
And again, I look forward to visiting the exhibition before it closes. Um, and again, it's been great to be with you all this evening and have a good night. Thanks everybody.